Hi, my name is Shwa and I am the host and founder of a podcast called Light Up with Shwa. It's a weekly podcast on conscious living and parenting. I hope you all are already subscribed to it. And if you haven't, please do so. I would like to introduce you to my special guest here today. Please tell me your full name and what do you do? I often get asked to say my own name. <laughs> <laughs> Taliesin Zahn Grenfell Lee. Oh, nice, nice. So, and uh, I'm an ethicist, okay. mostly Christian ethics. Okay. And my focus, my area of focus is ecological ethics, ecofeminist ethics. And at the moment, I'm working a lot on climate resilience. Ecofeminist ethics, what is that? Ecofeminism is basically an understanding that everything is connected. So whenever we have issues that affect women, it tends also to be basically 100% of the time there will be an ecological dimension to that. Okay. And when we have issues that affect the ecosystem, mm -hmm. women are the ones suffering the most. And it expands that idea mm -hmm. of intersectionality to include communities that are more poor, communities of color, mm -hmm. uh, Every time you have a hierarchy, mm -hmm. you usually have men at the top. Mm. And if you look at the bottom, then these are the people or the creatures or the ecosystems that are suffering. Mm. So ecofeminist ethics, just it never just looks at one thing. It always says, OK, we see a problem with racial justice. How are the women doing? How is the ecosystem doing? How are the poor people doing? OK. So you have done research in it. Mm -hmm. And you're a PhD. Yes. And you should tell everybody that you are. <laughs> you don't shy away from I that. I have a PhD. <laughs> it was yes. a lot of work. <laughs> yes, that's a lot of work. So that's, thank you very much for being here. And uh, I'm really looking forward to our conversation here today. I think it will be really rich and interesting. So my next question is, like, why did you choose this area, this uh, field? Well, I started actually as a biologist, okay. and I studied molecular biology, and mm. I really enjoyed that. Mm. I actually still miss it. Um, I just noticed that the things that I really felt passionate about were more justice-oriented than they were just the basic research of science. And so I ended up deciding to go to seminary, and I focused my major discipline was ethics. And I decided to study ecological ethics, which tied together my biology background with my interest in ethics. Mm. And then uh, as, a, as a woman, I became particularly interested in feminism. Now I have two daughters, okay. very personal interest. Mm. Uh, so it's really been lovely to tie together my love of biology and the natural world with my interest in ethics uh, in my current field of ecological ethics. Very nice, very nice. So what's the goal with the, what you have done so far? Like, where is it going to take you? What can we look forward to? Is there something we should, you know, watch out with your work? My like, work? Yeah. Currently, I'm focusing on climate resilience, okay. which, you know, there's a crisis. And how to be resilient in the face of this kind of planetary crisis is a really big question mm. that a lot of people have different answers for. Uh, and I'm really in favor of all the scientific research that's going on trying to address this crisis. Mm. It's just that my sense is that people are feeling frightened and sometimes frozen, sometimes overwhelmed or even in denial. Mm. And what I'm hoping is to help people move from a place of fear to a place of empowerment and from a place of isolation and disconnect to a place of connection and from this overwhelm and denial to a place of focus. So that's more like consciously living the environmental issue. Like you're trying to be more conscious about it, bringing awareness to people about being watchful of our environment, I guess? I think or that there are a lot of ways to engage with this issue. Okay. And one, the main one that I'm focusing on is how to build resilience. And resilience okay. is emotional resilience, it's mm. spiritual, it's mm. practical. We need to understand how to be a citizen of an ecosystem. What mm. if we don't have infrastructure? What if we don't have running water and electricity oh, okay. and mm -hmm. plumbing? How do, we, how do we manage that over the course of days and weeks and months? Because we're going to get more and more storms, and they are going oh. to wipe out our infrastructure. And if we have some preparedness and understanding of how mm. to be resilient in the face of natural disasters and how to be a community where we can work together and have some kind of preparedness and some kind of structures of food and water and waste, 
these are things that build empowerment instead of fear and overwhelm. Hmm. And we can't just rely on the government to figure it out and come in and help us. We need to take charge and actually hmm. take responsibility the way humans have throughout human history. So have we done anything in this field? Is this area being resilient? Have, is, there, is there work happening in this? Yeah, there's a lot of work. One of the things I did was I became certified in permaculture design. Okay. Permaculture is a, a way of growing food that understands the needs of every part of an ecosystem, including the land itself. Hmm. Uh, instead of trying to impose human will upon land and say, we want to grow this thing here and we want not to grow that thing there, hmm. you take a look at the land and the sand and the soil and the sunlight and the water and you say, what makes sense in this ecosystem? How can we work together with the other creatures and with the soils and with the waters to feed us, the humans, to feed everyone, to, uh, to do it in a way that um, just really helps everyone's needs be met in a way that doesn't require a lot of chemical, in doesn't require any chemical mm. input or um, even additional water input because this area is already perfectly suited to grow these things oh, and wow. not those things. Okay. And permaculture, as you can imagine, has branched into an entire concept of ethics, permaculture ethics, where like you kind of step back and look at society and say, well, what actually makes sense here? Instead of just trying to create something and then impose it on a community, okay. you look at it more from the ground up and yeah. say, what will flourish yeah. and, and be strong? How can we enhance whatever we have? Yeah. Like how to make it better? So permaculture is we... one example of okay. a resilient skill that mm. probably our very ancient ancestors all understood. But now we've kind of gone through the industrial revolution, we've gone through agricultural, uh, agriculturalism, and mm -hmm. we've basically divorced ourselves from really trying to have a relationship of respect with our ecosystems. Mm -hmm. So that's so that's is. one example. Another one is like, do you know how to build a shelter? You yeah. Know? Does you know how okay. to build a simple shelter so that you don't die of exposure? That's not hard. So uh, you you are knowledgeable about all these things. I'm knowledgeable at a lot of those things, okay. and I also have you know, as I mentioned, there's different aspects of resilience, and one of them is sort of psychological and spiritual. A big thing in the Nature Connection community is mindset. Mm. What's your mindset? Mm. And from a spiritual perspective, when bad things happen, sometimes people just kind of shut down and they feel abandoned and they, they just resort, they kind of retreat into a place of fear. If you have a spiritual tradition, then there are resources in there to help you understand when bad things happen how to have courage, mm. how to have hope, mm. how to find community. And those are just as important, maybe more, than these practical skills of, you know, how do we deal with human waste in the face of no, no running water? It's yeah. really important. Yeah. It's just that if you don't have the right mindset, you're just gonna huddle on the floor yeah. in, a, in a ball, yeah. <laughs> right? So that would be hard to manage. So I'm looking at resilience from a holistic perspective, yeah. psychological and spiritual and practical. So how can we learn about it? Like if somebody wants to learn about, okay, how do we build shelters or how to be resilient? Is there like everybody has to take a course or like what do we do? Like let's, I don't know anything. What, what do I do? The people that have really taken the lead in this area are the Nature Connection uh, community. Mm -hmm. And there's practitioners everywhere that mm. teach classes on this sort of thing. Okay. Um, so you can just look up Nature Connection or sometimes mm. people call it primitive skills or survival skills and they will teach you know interesting skills like tracking, how mm. to track animals and they'll teach you um, how to identify wild edible and medicinal plants in your ecosystem. Every single yard has amazing edible and medicinal plants in it but we just don't anymore know that. So if you do know that, then when you walk outside onto you know the grassy area, you feel like you're surrounded by friends. Mm. This happened. I had just learned about a particular plant called yarrow, sometimes called soldier's wound wart, mm. because it's so good at stopping bleeding. Oh, like this. Okay. So I had just learned about it's it. It's our local. It's uh, everywhere. People use yeah. it as an ornamental too. Okay. Yeah. So what's it's called? Yarrow. Y a r r o w. Yarrow. Yarrow, and it's a very useful one to know because with a W. Yeah. yeah. Because, uh, so my husband and I, we, I learned about it and then we were at a playground with our children and he was goofing off and he fell and he, he split his chin open and it mm. was just gushing. Oh. And I said, oh, I just saw yarrow over by the bench and I ran and I got yarrow and I made what's called a spit poultice. You chew it up, you spit it out. That oh. releases the medicine like out of the cells. Natives used to do. 
Yeah, yeah. so a spit okay. poultice. So you chew it up, you spit it out. I stuck it in the chin, and I had a Band-Aid because I'm a parent, and I put the Band-Aid on, and the bleeding just instantly stopped. Oh, wow. And I was like, oh, it worked. So then we, we thought we were something new here today. I mean, You're this welcome. is something really nice. This is a very know. useful plant to yeah, know. Nice and thing. so then we thought we were going to have to go home. I thought he might need stitches. But we were like, well, it seems fine. So we stayed at the playground until we were ready to go home. A couple hours later, we go home. I had shoved a little in my pocket, luckily, okay. because we go home and we said, well, should we take a look at it? Uh -huh. We peel off the Band-Aid, we take the yar uh -huh. off, blood immediately starts gushing okay. out of it again. So clearly the yarrow really, it was almost, Stop. it was like magic. It just stopped the uh -huh. bleeding. And you know, people who do this work, they're very intentional. Mm. They, they thank the plant. They kind of bless the plant, mm. and you really have this relationship, a kindred mm. relationship with these creatures as, you know, as kindred. Wonderful. And so I think I can just have her talk about all this, all this time. I mean, forget about parenting and everything. Right? Well, this is useful yeah. for parenting, yeah, right? Yeah, I know. And there's another That's plant. A... It grows where people walk because okay. it help, its roots help break up compressed soil. Uh -huh. That That's... My daughter, we were climbing a mountain, and she got stung by a bee. And I said, oh, I saw some of that. It's called plantain. It's no relation to the banana. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I ran okay. back, and I got this plantain, and I chewed it up, spit it out, and I stuck it on the bee sting. And, you know, within 30 seconds, there's no pain. There's no welt. Oh, it's wow. completely gone. Is it the plant or your spit? <laughs> I'm My spit <laughs> does help break apart the cell okay, walls, no, so the enzyme. It's an it's an interdependent <laughs> relationship. Uh, but That's just nice. knowing, just knowing, can you imagine just knowing those two plants? Oh, wow. You feel so much more empowered. Yeah, right? okay. And That's they're what everywhere. It is. They're literally everywhere around us, and most people don't know anymore. So I guess we need to start classes with you. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. because that's that's what, that's what I was talking about. Like we need to have this more part of our life, like learn in schools maybe, or adults or parents should go mm -hmm. and learn about all these plants. And well, this is resilience, it yeah. builds empowerment. Okay. And this plantain plant, you can also just eat it like a vegetable. This is, you know, it's oh, really? healthy. Oh, wow. It's just, um, again, if you're hungry and, you know. Mm. One day I was, uh, I was hiking around in Austria with uh, a group learning about permaculture mm -hmm. and I wasn't feeling great. I feel like I might be coming down with something. Hmm. And on the ground, I see some dandelion leaf and some plantain leaf, and I yes. thought, I'm just gonna, so I, so I ate a little, three or four of each. Hmm. I felt much better, didn't get sick, felt oh, fine. Wow. So they're so full would you, of nutrients and. So if somebody's hearing that you, and saying, oh, I can do that, it's fine, it's safe to do it? Well, yeah, the important thing is to know. Hmm. You really do have to know. But mm -hmm. if I asked you what's a carrot, you know what a carrot yeah, is. Okay. With 100% mm -hmm. certainty, you know yep, what a carrot yep. is. So, you know. I think so. I they, say, <laughs> they say if you would swear what this is in front of a room full of botanists, then you know what it is. <laughs> hmm. And you would swear what a carrot is, right? Yeah. In front of a room full of botanists, yeah. you're like, I am 100% yeah, sure yeah, this right. is a carrot. Yeah. So if you have someone show you, that's okay. the easiest way because then you, hmm. you know. Oh, wow. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. I didn't know I would end up talking about this for so long. But this is very important stuff. Really? Well, in this terms of a, parenting, yeah. you know, Queen Anne's Lace, this is a common flower we see on the side of the road with the big mm -hmm. white flower head. Mm -hmm. And the root is a wild carrot, which you okay. could eat. But what, what the seeds are is a natural birth control. Now, I want you to imagine that the climate apocalypse happens. We need to know what natural birth controls are. We women, we need definitely, to know that, Definitely, definitely. Right? How much do you take? Do you have to take it all month long? You know, you don't want to take a toxic level of it. So this is, you know, related this is to all parenting related too. To, yeah, of course yeah. it is. So that's very important. Oh, I guess um, I'm just wondering, like, <laughs> wow, that's really good. This is very it's, important. It's life changing. Yeah. It's transforming yeah. to start to develop this kind yeah. of relationship. Yeah. And my hope is that communities, churches, individual mm. families can mm. start to see themselves as part of an ecosystem, yeah. and really just because have I a different do, understanding of identity. Yeah. Because I do practice, like, you know, at home, the spices and all mm -hmm. the herbs and all. So this is also like outside the house, you're bringing the herbs in, but then you have plantations and your yard mm -hmm. and how to interact and be connected to all your environment. I guess it, now I'm understanding what you were saying. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Okay. And there's a deep spiritual component to yeah. it, which is why I like to work with religious communities. Okay. That's wonderful. It's very, it's very blessed. Mm. So now I, I don't need to ask you what is social and ecological ethics. You just said it. Oh, okay. Well, it's important to keep in mind the justice yeah, aspects the justice. of it. Okay. I mean, any city 
any urban city mm. could have plantain and dandelion growing. Mm -hmm. growing. Okay. So this is not something that's restricted for people in the suburbs or people okay. out in rural areas. Okay. And it's really important for all people to okay. have access to nature, natural mm. spaces, exactly. to understand them. Yeah. So I'll talk to you about this later because I don't want to um, move away from our topic today and I want to continue with our um, conversation but uh, I think I should make a note that what you just said that all the people should have the right to nature which means the land so everybody shares it nobody really owns it yeah right Access. so that yeah. that idea so I'll talk about it later in my other podcast and with you maybe in discussion so all right Let's uh, further our conversation. So the awareness that you have just uh, talked about and our environment and everything. I mean, I have all these questions because of your research and uh, with your background and with permaculture and everything. I think there is uh, the Garden of God I read in um, your um, somewhere in your write-up. Mm -hmm. How can we cultivate a sacred relationship with the Garden of God? So what did you mean by Garden of God? Well... Or did you already say it? No, no I mean, okay. I'll say two things. Sometimes language really does help us mm -hmm. adjust our relationship with ideas. Mm. Language matters. Yes. So calling something nature versus calling it the creation or mm. calling it the environment or calling it a divine garden, mm. it people react differently yeah. and have a different sense of responsibility or, or kinship yeah. with those different terms. So some people uh, think of a, a beautiful symbol for this place we live is a divine garden. Mm. And when you think of it as a divine garden, you really see the divinity in all of it. Mm. Sometimes people try to isolate divinity to humanity, a divine mm. image in humanity alone. And so when you see it as a divine garden, you can kind of see there's divinity in everything. In order to cultivate a relationship with it though, the most important thing I have found is to figure out what is the barrier between us and an intimate understanding of kinship with the creation around us. The barriers are different for different people. Uh, but for, for a lot of people, there's some squeamishness, there's some fear, there's a lack of knowledge, and there's also grief. Hmm. So I have found that the more time we spend out in the rest of nature, we find that nature actually makes a lot of space for our grief. So in a way, it actually confronts us with our deepest wounds. Hmm. So people, people in the Nature Connection community call it nature's wall of grief that you go out and you start doing this kind of nature connection experiences and you feel so joyful and so happy and then all of a sudden you just confr confront a wall. And our wounds, you know, our woundedness, whatever it is, uh, nature also gives us the way to heal hmm. if we will let yeah. it. So it That's kind of it hands us our grief yeah. and it hands us a way to heal. Mm -hmm. We just have to have the courage to be able to face that. And I think that that means we really need each other. We need someone to hold our hand and say, you can do this, it's okay. The only real path to healing is through our grief. So it's a gift that, that nature is giving us, yeah. of, a gift of healing, but we have to be willing to accept it and have the courage to accept it. And that I think requires some solidarity with one another, mm. some friends. Mm. And they don't have to be human, it can be your dog. <laughs> I'm just saying that mm. I think that in order to cultivate this relationship, we really do need to identify what's keeping me from it mm. and try to focus on that and heal that. Mm. Important. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Let's uh, talk about this question about democratic parenting. What do you mean by that? Democratic education, self-directed learning. Tell me more. You know, there are different styles of parenting and people kind of used to think that you had to choose between either authoritarianism and permissive parenting. And people have really tried hard to find a kind of compromise in the middle, which is really, it's called probably authoritative is what you would call mm -hmm. it. Parents have authority. It's just that they're not authoritarian about it. Mm. You work with your kids to try to figure out how to be a family together. A great example of this for me would be uh, 
my kids wanted to get iPod touches mm. when they were younger. Yep. And I said, I really don't think that's a great idea, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to stop you from doing it. But you're going to need to earn the money. I'm not going to give you the money for it. So oh. they worked really hard. It took them about a year, and they earned the money, and they each got an iPod touch. And I said, you know, I said to them, just so you know, the screens are really addictive. So you're going to need to figure out ways to set boundaries around screen time so that you don't end up just getting pulled in. There's always going to be another game yeah. or another app, of course. And so they, we've had a lot of conversations over the years. I've tried to model it. I've said, you know, I've kind of said out loud, you know, I feel like I've been using this phone a little too much. I think I need to, a little break from my phone. Or, but I don't reach in as a, you know, a dictator and say, this mm. and this. What I do is I give them a lot of information and then we have dialogue about mm. it and we decide together as a family, let's not have phones at the dinner table. Mm. So now if someone wants to look something up, we ask permission. We'll have a conversation and something interesting will come up and we won't know the answer. Yeah, and so somebody will say, do you mind if I look that up? Yeah, sure. Oh, so we'll nice. pull out something, we'll look it up and put it away. Uh, and so we just kind of work together as a family to try to build the kind of family we want to have. And uh, Nice. Probably the best example, another really great, I love to tell this example. My brother um, went to a talk and the woman said, you talk to your kids the way you would talk to your partner. And someone said, well, what if I came in and my husband was eating a bag of cookies right before dinner? And she said, what would you say? And my kid was eating, you know, my kid was eating cookies before dinner. And she said, well, what would you say to your husband if you came in and your husband was eating mm -hmm. cookies before yeah, dinner? That's a good and you would respond so differently. Like people have this reaction with their kids, like, stop that, don't yeah. do that. But we wouldn't do that with our partner. We yeah. say, why are you doing that? We're about to eat. You're yes. not going to be hungry. Yes. One of the phrases I often used with my kids was, if you do that, this might happen. Mm. And let them make the decision. Mm. And because I trusted them, it's mm. a real leap of faith. Because I trusted them to make a good decision, they basically always make good decisions. And if, mm. if they make a decision and something happens, they well, what did you learn? It's letting go, and that mm. takes courage. But yes. for me, it's been wonderful because wonderful. I have such great relationship with my kids. We Excellent. really are very Excellent. good friends. So. so how did you learn all this? I mean, it was a combination of things. Um, my brother went to the Sudbury Valley School for high school, and this is a democratic school. And I think that first sparked his interest. It was my older sister who found the school, and then my brother went to the school. He wasn't really at all enjoying public high school. It wasn't working for him. and. So that was way before I had kids. And it really started me thinking about this idea of democratic education. In democratic schools, the students and the staff together decide the rules of the school. Mm. And there's no curriculum. Mm. So students come, and they just do what they want to do every day. And if they decide they want to go to college, they study, and they take the SAT, and they go to college. And colleges love these students because they're very self-motivated. You can imagine. Oh, wow. They also really know who they are. They figure it out because mm. they have to. And this was fascinating to me. And so uh, it started me on this path of trying to understand democratic parenting. And um, in particular, I really like the book Parent Effectiveness Training, PET. This is a pretty old book, but it's a really good one. And it talks about reflective listening. You know, parents, kids come to you and they say something, and I have a strong helper archetype. I want to jump in and fix it. Mm. Well, I actually found that helping my kids fix their own arguments works much, much better than me reaching in and saying, don't you do that, and you don't do that, and you get one minute, and you get two minutes, and whatever, sharing, oh. blah, blah. Instead saying, what do you kids think would work? They mm. actually Giving come up Giving them with, the agency. Yeah, yeah, they come up with fantastic things that I never would have thought of that work much better because I didn't impose it on them. Mm. And what is the other reason? Do you have any other reason? Because you didn't impose on them, but then don't you think they are good judges of their situation and themselves? at that age, maybe they're more conscious and more aware than the adults are? Yeah. Maybe I mean, that's but, why they But a lot of parents it. don't, it doesn't occur to them. Yeah, right? that's true. We see them as receptacles for our yes. knowledge. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and that is true to a that's certain true. extent. That's and as a result of my trying as hard as I can to support them, hmm. they do ask me questions and they want to know what I think. Yeah. But I'm not just always yes. trying to shove it at them. That's wonderful. It is. Thank you. It's so fun. So you do all It makes being a parent so relaxing. <laughs> I remember so that is I, your parenting. Yeah, I, guess. I remember That's when it. we were still in public school, yeah. I remember coming home and saying, you know what, I'm not in charge of homework anymore. I actually don't care if you ever do it. Hmm. If you do it, I'm happy to help. If you don't do it, that is totally fine with me. Hmm. I am no longer in charge. Are they good in getting the good grades or are yeah, they good in studies? Yeah, they're very conscientious. Okay, okay. So... 
How old are your... Uh, you now have, they're 14 and 17. So you have two daughters. Mm -hmm. And, okay. So how is it going? Is it the teenage issues or... It's so funny because people talk about this yeah. and I have nothing. It's just fun. Oh, wow. It's so much fun. Really? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, we have such a So class. maybe the, uh, we, we can get some classes on permaculture, parenting, <laughs> how to handle teenage girls, all of it. People have a lot of issues, especially with the phones. Yes. Parents say, oh, okay, I'm going to restrict yes. your yes. usage at this time and this yes. time. I instead, I said, look, these are the dangers and the risks. Mm -hmm. And because I trust them, they trust me. It has to go both ways. Mm -hmm. I think it's a little hard if you don't have a relationship of trust over time. You have to build that. Yeah. But I just didn't want to be a police officer parent. That's it didn't nice. work for me. Right. So you didn't have that kind of parenting from your parents, I guess. I would say that, you know, this was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. So it certainly wasn't just what I'm doing. Mm. Um, but what I would also say is that my parents were very empowering people. They were mm. really empowering parents. Mm. They really did trust and empower That's us. That's what I'm thinking. Like, yeah. there, ha there has to be something coming from your parents. Like, I, I am sure you have been conscious and aware, but there has to be something coming to you from your yeah, autopilot. Yeah, I mean, I would say that I built on what they gave me, mm. and they were both very, really... Um, affirming of, mm. of my parenting. They, they thought that I had taken it into a really wonderful place, that wonderful. they had, hadn't even occurred to them. So mm. by my standards, they would be considered much more authoritarian than I mm. am, but probably for their day, not. Wonderful. Mm. I think I'll go with one more, and then I think we have to have more conversation with you because we, I, I am just still, you know, we're still on page one. <laughs> <laughs> We're still exploring here. So one more question, and then I think we'll go uh, to our second part of this uh, show. Uh, what's uh, so you mentioned your parents a bit, so and they contributed. Anybody else contributed in your um, managing how you should be a parent, and where did you get all this uh, laid back and consciousness, or how would you say it? I guess other than my parents, then really the two biggest sources of um, more specific resources would be all of my siblings, okay. all of them. Are you the youngest? In different ways. No, I am second Okay. out of five. Mm. And each of my siblings has just been invaluable to me oh, in wonderful. figuring out who I am and who I want to be. Wonderful. And helping me, give me resources for all these things we're talking about. We're a very close family. Very nice. Very nice. The other thing is, my, you know, and my grandparents too. I want to okay. say, you know, I was very lucky in that three of my four grandparents were still alive when I was in my 20s. And that's unusual nice. because they didn't have their kids very young. That's nice. But I also read a lot of books. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that's my personal. But you're, you're, not a, you're not following them only like by the book you know you're just no it's using just that i feel so grateful for libraries okay, i would go yes. to a library and there would be this children's room and there'd be a parenting section and i'd be looking and i'd say whoa mm -hmm. that's the book i need uh -huh. and that happened over and over that's i nice. can't say enough about libraries okay. i think that they are the most wonderful yes. part of any town i am with you i with really that. just so deeply grateful that's and such a blessing to I'm have sorry. that being a diverse person oh multicultural person not having that in other uh many other countries is uh, like, I really value that. So, yeah. yeah. I feel like I have a PhD in parenting. Yeah. The number of books I have read. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was going to say like, we can just have you for that. I mean, uh, it's fun. Wonderful. Um, what I would like to say is that uh, thank you very much for watching part one with Taliesin. I think we'll have to have uh, a few more or one more series of it. Um, we have a lot to cover, and I hope you stay tuned to our uh, show. This is Taliesin, and I'm Shua, and I hope you can uh, subscribe to my channel, and uh, I'll see you in the next episode. Thank you. Thank you.